Hi and welcome to Inside Intercom. Today I'm delighted to be joined by a friend and one of Europe's most prominent investors, uh, Christoph Jans from Point9 Capital. Hi Christoph, how are you doing? Hi Des, very good. How are you doing? Yeah, pretty good. Whenever I see you, I'm always reminded that you're the first check into our arch rivals as Endesk and that's one of, one of the sort of funnier stories which I first heard of you. I'm guessing you have been doing a lot less help desks and a lot more AI over the last while, is that right? Um, yeah, or maybe the intersection of the two, right? I, I think. Oh, all right. Okay. Probably a good topic for, for us to to, to, mm-hmm. to chat about, since help desk, like the the customer support industry, has a special place. I think in your heart and in in my heart as well. It's what it's really what got me into SaaS in two thousand eight. Yeah, I think it's a. I mean, one of the things, and probably the biggest thing I want to talk to you about is just how we um, how to think about like where are the opportunities in AI and where, like, if you're tra- thinking about entering customer support, is it a rich area for an entrant or is it an area that where like the, actually the incumbents have all the power? Uh, I think that's like probably the most interesting area to chat about. You wrote about this earlier. Uh, you have a post on Medium and we'll link it in the show notes, but the gist of it was a kind of a mental map of how you think about the opportunities. So maybe if we could just go back a little bit and say, so say it's like November 30th last year, ChatGPT has just dropped. Everyone's now realizing that generative AI is kind of here and it's, and it's not it's not fucking around, like it's pretty powerful stuff. How quickly did you react from an investment perspective? Were you like, oh, wow, we need to, like, you know, was it obvious to you immediately? Like, shit, there's going to be a lot of areas upended and we need to like reconsider uh, all of your investment ideas. Uh, or like, were you a kind of a, a slow believer? How, how did that play out? So for me personally, it's been a huge aha moment, like a, a wake up call, like to some extent, maybe an existential crisis, like a, a, lo- a roller coaster ride, thinking about the opportunities as well as the, the threats. Obviously, ChatGPT has been a success, like the typical overnight success, many years in the making, decades, if you look back at like what it's based on in terms of prior AI research. Um, but but nevertheless, I was taken by surprise seeing how well ChatGPT performs. And I think even people who have have been much deeper in AI have, have been surprised too. So I actually feel a bit embarrassed that I was so surprised. Anywhere you see grants for a threat, you'll probably as, a, as an investor see grants for an investment and then vice versa. If you see how the incumbents are pretty well defended, then you're probably not going to go and, and fund. What's like just to like our audience is primarily going to be like startup founders and um, folks who work in, in product and companies. What's an example of like an obvious this isn't going to work? Like as in as in like hey, all the power is with the incumbent. We should not write a check here. Like what w- what's like you know the worst case sort of pitch you'd get? So I'm I'm happy to answer it and then mention some areas where I'm pretty skeptical. But I would I will also say that there will always be exceptions, right? So it's we, we never have absolute knowledge on, on anything and there will always be founders who prove things wrong and that's that's amazing and I don't want to discourage um, anybody. But I would say in those areas that are very broad and horizontal, like word processing, um, spreadsheets, note-taking, to-do lists, calendars, basically like the classical Microsoft Office package, which is now also like the G Suite, I think in these areas, it's very hard to compete for pr- maybe relatively obvious e- reasons. Like everybody uses these apps already by Microsoft, Google, or, or Apple, essentially. They are either free or perceived as free because you, you get them as part of some kind of bundling. And I think there will be opportunities to win. And maybe Notion is an example or, or Airtable, like based on that framework, which I'm talking about a little, those companies shouldn't exist, but they do. So there are always founders who, who bend reality, but it's probably an area where you need the cliche 10x better and cheaper product. Uh, like 50% better is not good enough to win against Excel or, or Google Sheets. It needs to be very, very different in, in some vectors. So it seems like there's two barriers there. One is just like, hey, it's hard to compete with these things because you're going up against a pretty fully featured and also effectively free product. So a sprinkling of AI or even a lot of AI just might not be enough to overcome the $0 price tag. 
are there other areas where you're like, no, like the, the market is there, but I just think like, you know, so if we, you know, if we move away from areas like uh, say where the suite is a barrier, like the packaging is a barrier, are there other areas where you're like, Hey, the future of, I don't know, something like expense tracking or the future of like work day or tools like that is, is, is still pretty impenetrable for, for other reasons. Yeah. So I, I think I have a like medium strong weekly held opinion on this like weekly held because i'm always happy to learn and be be convinced of the opposite but i i tend to think that in those areas where you have a strong SaaS company um like intercom or zendesk in case of support or um like in 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 hr you have like factorial personio like where you have a company that's not 30 years old, but maybe 10 to 15 years or 15 years old. I think those companies are in a great position to, to leverage AI if they are still able to move fast enough, which is probably not true for every company, um, but it is true for, for some. And, and you spoke about how you like led these efforts at, at Intercom. So Intercom is an, kind of like, I think a role model for a company that's already at a sizable scale, but still moving really fast. And I think um, it's not so clear how a startup can find an angle of attack in these markets. Yeah. I think the challenge oftentimes that folks overlook is um, it's not that it's impossible to find a way in which AI is really cool. And it could be like really powerful AI, but the challenge is you still have to go and build out everything else. Like, so if, if you like look at intercom and you say, right, you know what, they're not AIing hard enough. We can do more AI than them. Like if you really want to rob a customer office, you still have to go and build a ticketing solution, uh, like a voice solution, a inbox, live chat, a messenger, a knowledge base, articles, you name it, right? You have to do all that shit and then do your AI on top. And I think there are other areas where like, it's just more, um, like more attackable because actually the AI forms the majority of the new product that you would build. Um, maybe to like just sticking in, in the existing business area, what about this idea of like, we're going to build the co-pilot type solution for everything? Yeah, I think the, this has pretty quickly become a pretty obvious idea, right? Like popularized by GitHub's co-pilot, which as far as I know, was the first one uh, to have this, this, this label. And very quickly you had like co-pilots for, for everything. I think the concept makes sense in the in the in so far as I, I do believe there will be some kind of co-pilot or even autopilot, which we can talk about as well, for every software. But it doesn't mean that it's an opportunity for a new company to uh, to disrupt the existing players, like for, for some of the reasons you've mentioned. And to your point on all the things that you have to rebuild. Um, I think if you if you keep that in mind, then maybe this idea of an autopilot is more promising. And the idea being here that you're not you're not you're not even trying to replace something like Intercom, but you come in and tell the the customer you don't you don't have to adapt any new software. What you get from us is a virtual team member, like a customer support agent, or it could be a sales agent, or an, SDR or financial analyst who is being onboarded and trained to your existing systems, quite similar to how you would onboard and train a human employee. And that virtual team member will then take over a certain part of the job in, in, in the beginning, probably a little like whatever can already be done well enough with AI, but over time, more and more, I think that's just a really interesting, quite fresh proposition, um, but um, I think quite quite early on to tell how how this is going to work or in which markets it's going to work, because until recently this wouldn't have been possible, at least not if you want to be a high margin business um, and don't want to do it manually. Yeah, I, I think uh, I so I totally agree with you on the um, on, on we uh, like. Um... I think everyone's been studying this space pretty closely in terms of like, like 
this company is like, let's say there's like adept out there who have a bot that can like drive a browser and can learn how to do recurring tasks that people have to do, like enter a lead in Salesforce or whatever. I think all that stuff is like, um, is like, we're, it, that still feels like we're at the early stages of that. Like in that, I, like I, I know exactly what you're describing. I, I could totally imagine a, a autopilot that like literally sits inside an Expensify and approves or rejects expenses based on everything it knows about the expense policy and everything it knows about the Expensify UI or something like that, right? That makes total sense. I haven't seen it yet, but like I, I feel feel like that's going to be like the next sort of um, the next wave of innovation will be this idea of like products that effectively run themselves. Uh, and you you literally your job is to train the bot, and the bot actually does the work. And what's interesting to me there is like there's all sorts of like downstream implications around everything from like brand and differentiation right through to like pricing so like the pricing thing's obvious you're not selling seats anymore and that's just a big change when you've got one megabot doing all the work but the brand and differentiation is interesting as well because if no one's logging into these products what is the product like it, it's almost like midware or it's like a, it's a background service running you know it's like it's not it's no longer a thing like you're like um you're actively diminishing the role of the software in the company's life if you know what i mean all of a sudden, like, you know, you don't care who you're using for expense tracking. You just send an email and look away and it's all done. And that's fine. But then when something is so, so isolated and and still performing well, you would happily just plug and play. You'd swap, you know, honestly, that it's hard to see that not becoming like a race to the bottom or whatever, because it'll be like, there's like, there's no advantage to having beautiful UI. There's no advantage to having like, you know, like it, it's not obvious to me. Do you have a sense of in a world where like, um, where like increasingly large amounts of the product workflows are handed over to like, you know, autopilots or like megabots or whatever you might want to call them. Uh, how will customers go shopping? Will it just be a pure utilitarian sort of like who is doing the job best and that's who I'll pick and I don't care about anything else? And the, uh, there is this funny quote, I think from a, from economics professor at Harvard or something, uh, who said like people don't want to quarter inch drill. They want a quarter inch um, hole in, the, in their wall. So they are not... Professor Theodore Levin, if you're oh, curious. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Your, uh, I, I think it's it's probably applies pretty well to software. I think businesses, in exceptions in some areas, creative tools and so on, but in many cases they don't use and buy the software because they are so thrilled to buy another software and to to train their employees how to use it. They they need it to achieve a certain result, and um, whether that's money in the bank um, and if. Maybe they don't have to use an invoicing software for that, but they get money into their bank's account in a different way. They'll probably be quite open to it. Or they could probably imagine not using the software that their SDRs use for their email campaigns if they just get the leads, which is what they want. So I, I think this, this is a promising strategy for new entrants, but I think you make some really great points. Like if you think about like kind of like try to think this to the to the next level or to the end, it's it's really hard to say. Yeah, exactly. And so that headless software is where I think. Um, well, I think if you extrapolate from what the patterns we've seen, it's quite possible a lot of currently pretty visible products will end up headless. And then it's just interesting to think about what will be like the what will be the primary software products of a company in like ten years time or whatever. It's yeah. Um, if we change direction for a little bit, along with just displacing and destroying and reinventing all the current sort of, you know, classic tooling of our world, there's also just brand new categories, right? Like there's new stuff, there's literal new things that are possible now that wasn't possible before. And you, you have some ideas around like what, what these are, like do, do, where my mind goes is like the entire say like Dolly space or like virtual videos that can be created and en endless stories that can be animated and all that. This is all just literally wasn't possible. And there will be products built out of these areas. How do you think about, about like just the, the brand new capabilities that are out there and which of them will actually be features and which of them will actually be products, et cetera? I think this is actually the most interesting place to build new companies because, well, you don't have an incumbent that you have to displace and you you leverage like new technologies to build to to solve big problems like in, in a way that it wasn't before until recently so what what can be better than this for a for a startup right do we have to, just out of curiosity do you have an example of one that you're happy to speak about i'm really looking for examples just to help people kind of understand the difference between like 
Slack with AI versus like, you know, one, one of my portfolios would be like, say, Synthesia, right? Where it's like, hey, generate AI, AI powered videos based on like vi sm small video input, like literally wasn't possible four years ago. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, I think Synthesia is a great example. And another one in the generative image creation space in our portfolio is a company called Mocker AI, which creates like virtual product phot photography. And interestingly, they started a couple of years ago with a 3D model based approach. So they simplified 3D CAD modeling and turned it into a virtual photo studio that worked reasonably well, but it was still a bit too, too hard to create the scene and place the object and get the virtual lights and everything right. Despite the fact that it, they made it much, much easier compared to like um, sophisticated 3D modeling software. And then about a year ago, they started to play around with some of the image generation models. And initially they were still a bit skeptical, like will the quality be uh, good enough? But through just iterations over a couple of months, they improved it so drastically that the quality of the photos is now basically indistinguishable from real photos. And that's really something that wasn't possible before and, allow, and allows product marketers or marketers, people in online shops to create huge variations of variations of an uh, existing image, which is obviously great for A-B testing and all kinds of other things. Yeah. And another example would be a company called Siriact, which we invested in quite recently, which uses computer vision to power the pick and pack robotic arms. Like they, they started out or they've been doing ML research for, for many years. So like pre LLM, but they are now using um, LLMs to build something which they call pick GPT where you basically you give a conversational command and the model translates that into an instruction for the robotic arm. Those are really fascinating use cases and where it's, it's where it's also really just hard. Like it's not only hard from an AI perspective, also from a systems integration and sales perspective. That's what I was going to say. I mean, what I love to say about that is that I believe it might be possible, but more importantly, I believe no one's going to be like, Ooh, we should do that. Like I'm always terrified of clever ideas that are definitely doable because all they need to do is just go viral on Hacker News and all of a sudden you've got like 27 spin outs or like 27 copies of that idea, each with their own sort of little variation. No one's going to be like, oh, I'm, I might try and control a robotic arm. I, I have one of those on the shelf over here. Or at least like it's like your, your competitive set so much smaller. If I was to sort of ask you to sort of express preferences, I'll just, we'll do this in a quick fire form. Are you more excited by like uh, new product areas enabled by AI or applying AI to existing areas? New, new, new areas. Like it's not black and white, but to answer your question directly, if I, if, if, if you ask me this as a binary question, then I go for the new areas. Yeah. 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 I, I, and I'm kind of, I, I'm, yeah, I'm, I am kind of trying to force, you know, everyone's going to say, everyone's going to say the filler text, which is well, if you've been really interesting, take on an area that's right for disruption. Of course, I, we assume that verticals or horizontals. Verticals. Lastly, uh, hard or easy? Hard. Yeah, so it's interesting. So like, and like maybe your robotics example is is a great piece there, but also I would argue probably the the, the product mocker is probably also similar in that like it's arguable some of the biggest winners here will be only existing software. I think incumbents when the AI is how would you say accessible and and it's obvious what you should do with it. So in customer support, you you would say like. Uh, it's obvious that people are going to build generative chatbots to answer questions, right? The real hard part is having a complete solution that lets like humans and AI work side by side together and making sure that like you actually fit within the support team and you're not just some like external kludge that's kind of wedged into the stack. But I think in general, like in well-established existing categories that have active incumbents who are like reading, reading the right tech blogs and following the industry, I think it's hard to imagine too many of those companies dying because they don't, you know, unless they have some sort of religious opposition to AI. Whereas I, I think in the other areas you describe, like say, when you go into verticals, inherently you're going to bump into less competition usually. And when you go into hard tech, you're going to bump into less competition. Yeah. And, and, and then if you're building it, like, what, you know, a new type of thing, you're almost, you know, the work you're displacing isn't a software product. It might be 
a team of photographers or it might be a you know a, a, a team of humans who lift stuff in warehouses or whatever but like it's 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 rarely going to be like hey we have to cancel our subscription to such and such and turn on our subscription to mocker um so like yeah i think that's an interesting uh, thesis but let's ask you then like uh, companies you wished that you had have invested in over the last year in, in this sort of generative ai space there's obviously been some pretty hot ones are, are there ones where you're like hey like i wasn't even in the deal didn't hear about it till it was done but man it looks like a monster company what's your favorites in that regard probably 11 labs um the um the voice uh, generation voice cloning company which we saw a bit too late like when it was when they had so much traction that they raised a, a large round which so they were too quickly kind of like out of the 0.9 sweet spot or sweet range I, I think people still have different opinions about this company and this tech and if this will get commoditized and open ai is working on this and and many others so obviously the jury is still out um, but it's an extremely impressive team very small team built probably the world's best text to to speech engine and i think if they just keep pushing it as they did in the past i think they they have a chance to winning something really big despite the fact that it probably looks like a, a battle against all odds if you go into a category where all the big players have their their stakes and are, are also investing large amounts of money how do you think about the sort of what we would call like the platform risk, like the idea that, hey, actually the next version of like you know, GPT-5 and, and the next round of ChatGPT will include a speak into the microphone for 60 seconds and we'll clone your voice. Like that's obviously some type of, uh, at the very least, like a low end risk, you know, for like the casual consumer. When you're looking at opportunities, how do you think about like what what's going to get absorbed either into like open AI or into chat GPT, or maybe in the future, like into when, when we get there into the operating systems, like as in iOS, will do that natively. You don't need a you know, custom app to do it. How do you assess platform risk? I think it goes back to the points that you asked about or that you made about hard problems and in either verticals or in like very specific horizontal use cases. Um, I think the more specific the use case is that a company solves or maybe maybe even obscure, I think the less likely it is that it'll be part of the next release of ChatGPT. I, I do think that, I mean, it's been a very, very, I don't know when this show will air, but it's been a very interesting weekend. So like the future of uh, the company OpenAI is maybe a bit less clear than it was uh, two or three days ago. Um, just for our listeners, I'll say we're recording this on Tuesday, the 21st of November, just so that everyone has the context of what we're talking about. But yes, I think it's a, it's, I'm less certain that OpenAI is going to like dominate the world right now than I was seven yeah, days ago. Exactly. Exactly. Same here. And nevertheless, whether it's going to be OpenAI or whether it's going to be Microsoft plus Sam Altman or like something from Google or Facebook. So I think there will be very impressive products from the big players and they will target the end consumer, but also the businesses, including enterprises. So for example, like this use case, um, have a, like talk to my data, like chat GPT for my company data. I I'm a massive believer in this. I think every company wants this. I I'm, I'm sure there is a huge pull. Like it solves this decade, all like knowledge issue, but I'm not sure if it's like specific enough to be an amazing startup opportunity. Um, because I, my, my guess is that in one of the next versions of OpenAI, they will do this. Yeah, exactly. Or, or the G Suite will just include it somewhere. Like ask the question of like, who's working on blah, blah, blah. And the G Suite has access to like literally everything. And like the idea of you building all of those things or building a, an API that's some, into the Google Drive that has advantages over Google, it just seems really, really hard to penetrate, right? At the, we're at the risk here of just saying like verticals are the best place to go. What's hard about verticals? I think maybe even if we forget about AI for a minute and we can come back to it uh, in a minute, what people have, um, I think, generally not liked about vertical SaaS, which made it at times difficult for us to raise follow-on financing for our vertical SaaS companies, is that the market size is somewhat limited. So we... Um, we invested at a company called Clio um, in 2009, which is legal practice management. So it allows small law firms uh, to run their entire practice. 
And for some time, it was thought that the market is not, not big enough because, well, you can count the number of lawyers in, in the US or in the industrial world and multiply that by what they might be willing to, to pay. And then you probably get to billions, but not hundreds of billions. Um, and I, I think in many cases or for many markets, those investors have been proven wrong for a couple of reasons. I think one, those companies have a chance to get much, much higher market share. So there is a chance that ultimately a company like Clio will own maybe 40% of the market as opposed to maybe 2% or 3%, which maybe you would get in a, in a horizontal market. And then these companies, or some of them have also managed to continuously increase the, the ARPA, the average revenue per account, by just doing more and more for their customers over time, which is maybe a bit against the conventional wisdom of focusing on something. I think focus is important as initially, but then... Yeah, you, you can grow it out, right? You can expand your sort of like, hey, well, let's solve more problems now that we have the customer base. That, that makes sense. I, I think like going vertical is like, what you trade off with in, in like total market size, because it's not like the hundreds of billion dollar market that a VC might want to hear it in order to justify the check. You, you trade the massive market for, I think, a more direct uh, line to these customers. So if you just need to re reach dentists, that's a lot harder than reaching SMBs, five to 25 people. Like it's dentists, they all go to dentistry conferences and read dentistry blogs. Like, you know, it's like, it's a very attackable market. And then se uh, secondly, uh, you're almost always not bumping into like, for lack of a better word, like the cool kids of Silicon Valley, you know, like every YC incubator is not going to spin up 25 more businesses going after the dentistry area, but I guarantee you they'll spin up 25 more AI for image generation uh, startups or whatever. So there, you know, it's almost like if you're willing to dial down your ambition, you can dial up your expectations of hitting the ambition because you're probably going into like an, in, an open sort of market where like they're all ready to pull the product off you. No, absolutely. That's, that's, those are some of the reasons why we really love these vertical markets. And they, the companies that we know of, they, they usually don't double year over year for many years. So they tend to grow a bit slower because the market is not infinite in terms of size or maybe because some of the verticals are maybe lagging behind in terms of tech adoption, but we've seen that they have an, some of them have just an amazing persistence. So they just keep growing 30, 40, 50% year over year. And if you do this for 15 years and you just never stop, you end up with a pretty, pretty sizable business as well. My last question on sort of tactics of investing, are the check sizes different in a world of generative AI? Like, and, and, and is, is your, Concerns around margin different, like knowing that a lot of money is going to go straight through the startup over to Anthropic or OpenAI or whoever, and that the margins that you might have been used to like 80, 85% SaaS margins, that might not be the case if every single customer interaction is like round trip through a server that's through some pretty expensive GPT-4 calls. This is definitely a topic for some of the companies I'm, I'm working with. Like they, like sometimes they are able to build a feature like in testing or in beta works really well, but it only works really well with GPT-4, which however is in, in some cases just too expensive, right? So then I think one possibility, one possibility, but also a challenge is maybe you can make it work with GPT-3.5, which is much, much harder. The quality is not as good out of the box. In a lot of cases, I see startups just been like crossing their fingers and just being like, it'll get cheaper, <laughs> you know, that, and, and like, yeah, that, exactly. that might be a valid strategy, you know? I, and I, I think that's actually a pretty good bet to make. I mean, you have to think about timing and maybe you're willing to accept lower gross margins or maybe even negative gross margins if, if you have the funding and if it's a, if you want to, if it's a, you want to claim your space as long as it can become a viable business based on certain assumptions for cost reductions, because I think the costs are going to get down, right? Like, and, and on check size, do you just like, are you happy enough to just, I guess, like accept these businesses need more money and therefore for it to be viable, we have to give them more and maybe that changes ownership percentage. Maybe it doesn't, but like, you're kind of, you're aware that like 2 million into a generative AI startup isn't actually as big as it sounds these days, right? So with the companies that we've invested in, I think with one exception, none of them 
plan to spend like millions or tens of millions on on compute um, uh, because they the most of the companies that we invested in are not at like the foundational level or, or close where they're not they, training they models or anything like that. Not so much less. Yeah. yeah, like they they do some training but not as high intensity. Okay, last kind of general question. Obviously, you know, it goes without saying, I'll say this for you. If if you're working on a hard startup in a new tech area, ideally in a vertical, we'll link up all of the various point nine or your email address or whatever way you prefer it. When you look forward into 2024, I mean, I presume you're probably still active enough for the rest of this year, but I know generally it starts to die around now. Thanksgiving starts, et cetera. People start to like dial down their expectations and fundraising will pick back up. Do you have any, any sort of either projects at point nine or any ambitions or any, any startups you're very keen to like sort of find next year? Yeah. I mean, we're, we're definitely active. We're looking at interesting companies right now and i think we'll continue to see interesting companies in the next months and the next year but it's somewhat hard to predict for us right like we don't have a quota or a goal of making a certain number of investments and uh, we're we're open for for business uh, so to speak but that means that sometimes we don't make an investment for two or three months but then sometimes we might make five in a in, in a quarter Okay, cool. Christoph, thank you so much for the conversation. It's been a lot. We'll link up all your details in the show notes, including your mental model for investing in AI. Really enjoyed the conversation. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Des. I enjoyed it as well. Thanks.